this is a clip that I that was sent to me uh, uh, from a, a friend who said, "Hey, you need to really check this out." Um, and it's a documentary that has been produced. It's screening at film festivals. Um, it's sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. Um, and really, the name says it all. Uh, it's a ch children's animated film called Mama Has a Mustache. Uh, and so you can imagine what that means. You can imagine uh, 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 the content of this. But it's basically an animated film that interviews uh, kids, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, about their impressions of gender and sexual identity. Um, and then cobbles these things together with some kind of cute children's style animation um, that is pushing a uh, kind of kid's version of radical gender theory, taking those academic concepts, distilling it down into a little, uh, a, a little kid show. And so uh, we're going to watch the trailer. I think it'll give you a sense of what it looks like. So what's the first question? Can you, can you be a girl and have a boy body or be a boy and have a girl body? Yes, that's transgender. Can this person be a parent? Yes, my dad. I feel like I'm not really a boy or a girl. Because my God is in me. I love myself. <laughs> Mama has a mustache. Mommy has a mustache. And so, uh, I mean, there it is. It's in some ways self-explanatory, but I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, why this film obviously is kind of on its face uh, uh, ridiculous, but what is really going on underneath the scenes? And I, I think the, the, the first dead giveaway, as I watch this clip, as I think about it, is that the kids are saying things that, uh, that, that kids don't uh, come up with by themselves. Uh, these are actually quite obviously uh, words that are being fed to these kids and then fed back to the camera. You know, they're saying stuff like, uh, you know, a girl can be in a boy's body, a boy can be in a girl's body. Um, you know, trying to get uh, through the mouth of the child some of those principles of queer theory and radical gender theory. Um, and then they're trying to make it uh, kind of infectious to say, oh, this is cool, this is good. Um, I mean, I think it's obviously not. Uh, I think that uh, when you're looking at these um, um, themes, um, they're, they're, they're really not appropriate for kids. Uh, they're pushing an ideology rather than something that is coming up in that normal process of development. And then the other thing that you'll notice about this documentary, if you go to the website, is that it uh, has some pretty heavy hitting sponsors. It has, uh, it has banks, it has companies, and then there's one sponsor in particular that I think is uh, quite revealing. There's a pharmaceutical company called AbbVie, A-B-B-V-I-E, um, that is a sponsor of this film that's putting uh, uh, money or resources uh, into the production and marketing campaign. And um, what is this company? Why would it be putting money into, into this, uh, uh, this really kind of left-wing cultural product? Well, it's because AbbVie is the company that sells the drug Lupron. Um, and if you don't know what Lupron is, it has a number of uses, a, a number of unsavory uses and some more normal uses. But a number of years ago, they tested this drug, which uh, kind of reduces testosterone level. It kind of takes your testosterone and then craters it. Uh, they were running tests on convicted sex offenders. There's a, a really long article, and I believe Boston Magazine that talks about this. They're saying uh, doctors called it a, quote, chemical castration drug. The idea is that you give it to sex offenders, pedophiles, child molesters, convicted uh, uh, criminals in order to uh, kind of crater their libido to, to get them to be more, less likely to re-offend. Essentially taking their sex drive and, and cratering it. Um, some of those uh, tests were inconclusive or they didn't work. I think since then they've, they've, they've moved back away from that. But, but the makers of Lupron have found another use for the same exact drug. Um, not approved by the FDA, it's an off-label use, uh, but they're actually giving it to kids um, as part of uh, puberty blocking, as part of kind of hormone therapy for uh, uh, taking males, for example, uh, and then uh, transforming them into females, at least in, 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 in a kind of gender sense, boys into girls, men into women. Um, and so the company is finding a kind of sponsorship for its target audience. Uh, you have people that are watching this film, people that are excited about this film, uh, may want to put their kids uh, or, or, or their students uh, on Lupron. There's a kind of direct pathway from some of these cultural products 
to some of the institutional uh, usages and schools and elsewhere, um, to then ha putting kids onto this medical pipeline. And I've done a lot of reporting on this in the last uh, you know, four to six months. And what we've seen is that there is a real nexus. It's documented. Uh, I've talked about it in, for example, in Chicago, um, where the gender clinics in Chicago are working with the schools uh, to put kids on what I think of as a school to gender clinic pipeline. They're going into schools, teaching them the principles of radical gender theory, teaching them that they might be trans or non-binary or pansexual or genderqueer or whatever the kind of flavor of the week is as far as gender identity. Um, and then they're uh, leading them ever so gently towards that uh, medicalization process. And um, this is, uh, of course, I think lucrative for hospitals. A lot of these treatments cost, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars at the outset and then thousands of dollars per month for, for maintenance. Uh, in many cases, a lifetime maintenance. Um, but I don't actually f subscribe to the idea that you hear from a lot of people, oh, follow the money. It's just about money. The hospitals are getting, uh, and doctors are getting rich on this. They're doing it uh, to line their own pockets. Sure, there's probably some of that, right? None of us are immune from financial incentives. But I actually think the deeper reason is that these people are ideologically committed. Uh, they, they love this ideology. They want to promote this ideology. They believe in this ideology. You have a kind of gender equivalent to the uh, social and political ideologies um, um, that are distilled down to personal experience. And so when you compare, for example, critical race theory to radical gender theory, um, the key difference is that uh, CRT seeks to change society. It cha wants to change government. It wants to change the distribution of resources. It wants to change things writ large. Whereas the starting point for gender ideology, something that you see very clearly here, is internal. It's individual. It wants to change the uh, kind of inner psychological process or the inner identity process. And the revolution begins from within and then extends outward into society. And they, at the same time, people have that same uh, fundamental kind of passion or fanaticism for this. And so when you get uh, activists that latch on to a narrative, that try to push it in schools, that try to create uh, film and television content around it, that try to um, they try to really do what they're doing in the film, getting kids to start thinking in these terms, getting kids to say, well, my mother may have a mustache. Uh, uh, and that's totally great. That's, that's really cool. Um, uh, 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 you, you can see the beginnings or the origin point of the ideology. And then you see, well, okay, who's involved with this? Oh, the pharmaceutical company that then is the last step in this process. And I think if you look at the uh, so-called social contagion, the evidence seems... Uh, pretty strong, even on the face of it, um, you've had this, as, as this messaging, this narrative has been pushed in entertainment, pushed in schools, you see a really geometric increase in the number of kids identifying uh, in these synthetic sexual identity categories. And then you have a geometric increase of the kids that are going through the medicalization process. Um, and so anytime you see that kind of curve, that kind of uh, viral spread, as far as the mathematics of it, you have to think, okay, well, what's going on? This looks like a kind of contagion process. It's not always that way. It doesn't always mean that's necessarily true. Uh, but I think in this case, it is. And I think that this film is, a, is a, an example of what this ideology looks like as a cultural product. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really has astonished me is to think in all the entry points where the radical left or the kind of the, the, the sexual politics of the radical left find entry within the institutions. Uh, you know, this film finds its, its place in the arts community, uh, finds its place in the documentary world, might find its place on some kind of television broadcast. Um, but, uh, but you also see this same core set of ideas being pushed in the curriculum uh, for kids that are, are very, very young. Um, and I think that it's making a lot of parents uh, deeply uneasy. Um, sure, I talk to a lot of people, some of whom uh, know what I do, some of whom don't know what I do. Um, but when I talk to folks, um, you know, teachers or school administrators, even if they're, it's in casual conversation, they don't know what I do, I always ask them about this. Hey, what's, what's going on at your school? And I've had a number of recent conversations with people uh, that were, you know, for example, working at a middle school. And they say, oh yeah, you know, 20% of my girls roughly now have uh, non-binary or or kind of non-male or female, uh, non-girl or boy identities. They're, they're you know, 
uh, uh, kind of non-standard gender and sexual identities. And so, you know, um, you know, 20% of the kids are non-binary. Um, you have to start thinking in terms of how do kids think, how do they glom onto these identities. And the danger in this, of course, is that, um, you know, you are um, putting this idea uh, out there, you're promoting this idea through the institutions, and then in some cases you're giving, uh, medical institutions are giving children uh, the same drugs that were used to uh, chemically castrate uh, sex offenders. Um, I, I mean, this is just something that is so obviously uh, uh, dangerous, it's obviously risky, it's obviously gonna create huge liability. Um, it's really an interesting moment. And I think if we wanna now kind of sum up all of these different threads, if you wanna kind of pull them together, um, they're all interconnected. You've seen Disney talking about uh, gender ideology, pushing that uh, as fast as it can into the cultural programming. You see the stochastic terror lie that basically says any criticism of this, or even any reporting, simply pointing out that something is happening or that something exists is a form of terror that must be suppressed. Uh, and then you're seeing these cultural products that are so obviously uh, contrary to the values of most people, I think including the majority of, 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 of gays and lesbians in the United States, who, who you know, uh, are, are unlikely to say that they want uh, their kids to be taught in kindergarten that they could adopt a, a pansexual identity. Um, you see them all working together in a, in a, in a way that is, they complement one another, they help push together, uh, push, push one another forward, um, and I think it's gonna really require um, uh, uh, some smart and strategic policy work um, to you know, protect kids and to make sure that uh, the values of our institutions are aligned with the taxpayers, with families that, that, su that support them, that create them. And this has to be done in an intelligent way. I mean, I think that um, what we have to do first off is be very clear uh, that pointing out, uh, for example, simulated sex acts by drag queens in, in bars um, uh, isn't, uh, has nothing to do with uh, uh, being uh, LGBT. It's not anti-LGBT to say, hey, what, hey, what, we want to actually uh, look at this twice. This is probably not appropriate for kids um, because that's really the, um, the, the key move that you see uh, kind of worked on this, on the left. As they say, any criticism of this is anti-LGBT. LGBT. It's hate speech. It's hatred towards a protected class. I don't think that's true at all. Um, you know, I actually have been very careful in my own work. Um, uh, I've had never conveyed any kind of sentiment like that. I think any reasonable person that reads, for example, my expose on Drag Queen Story Hour um, uh, would look at it and say there's not a, a bit of animus towards uh, any group. Uh, it's really looking at the behavior. It's really looking at the, the actions themselves to say, hey, you know, pushing this ideology uh, pushing you know, queer theory, pushing radical gender ideology uh, on kids uh, is wrong for two reasons. One is because the ideology uh, is intellectually indefensible. Uh, and then second, because you're pushing it onto kids that shouldn't be exposed to these sexualized themes, really no matter the orientation of the sexualization. Uh, and so conservatives have to be tough, they have to be straightforward, they have to be willing to take the hits. Um, but we also have to be very careful in how we use language. We have to bring on board as wide of a coalition as possible. We have to get a huge group of people um, from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, uh, to start coming together to say, you know what, we're gonna actually create some barriers. There are gonna be some limits. Because the heart of queer theory, for example, starting with Michel Foucault, going to Gail Rubin, going to uh, uh, other queer theorists in the 90s and 2000s, um, is the abolition of limits. They want to get rid of all limits, all taboos, all restrictions on, on sexuality. Because they believe that beyond those taboos is, a, is an ultimate uh, sexual liberation. Um, and we have to say, you know, in theory, uh, you know, we understand what you're saying, but in practice, this is a very dangerous ideology. And we should have prudent limits, especially when, it, when it's involving kids. And so this is a debate we absolutely should be having. Uh, we can do it in a way that is utterly defensible, uh, in a way that gets 70 to 75% support from the public, much like the Parental Bill of Rights in Florida delivered, uh, and in a way that uh, disrupts and really exposes the fraudulence and hypocrisy of the so-called stochastic terror connection. Um, because look, 
uh, uh, if you play the clips, if you watch uh, the, the, the videos, if you uh, run the trailer, um, this is, this is uh, uh, an ideology that, uh, if it's exposed to the public, um, uh, cannot survive. Because the public, including the majority of gay and lesbian people, will reject it. And so they try to win by shutting down the debate, by suppressing different di kind of dissenting voices, and even appealing to the government to actually throw people, including reporters, in prison. Um, and uh, we're up then against a kind of serious fight. But I think that as long as we are putting forward the argument, as long as we are sticking to the facts, uh, it's a fight that we can win.